And what we're about is having conversations that affect our neighborhoods and our communities. Um, we want everybody to be uh, feel welcome and included. So what we're going to do to start is do a quick uh, round robin, just very briefly, if you would say who you are and where you live, and and then we'll jump into a very uh, full agenda. So. I'll start by saying that I'm Cindy Cook, and I'm here just to help with uh, moving the conversation along. I live on East Avenue, and I'm glad to see so many people here. Uh, Peter Hayden, I'm on uh, 120 East Avenue. Matthew Annis, also 120 East Avenue. You just pass it. Jonathan Chapel Sokol, Ward 1, North Prospect Street, and I'm on the steering committee. I'm Fletcher, I'm on Riverside Ave. Hi, my name's Rebecca, I live on Brooks Ave. Hi everyone, my name is Liv Pena. I live on South Willard Street and I'm also on the steering committee. I'm Selena Colburn. I live on Latham Court and I'm a representative for the Chitton 6 4 district in the legislature. Sharon Busher, I live on East Avenue and I'm the Ward 1 city councilor. Hi, I'm Keith Pillsbury. I live on University Terrace, and I'm the Ward 8 School Commissioner. Hi, I'm Jack Hansen. I'm the East District City Councilor. I live on Pearl Street in Ward 1. Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah King. I'm in Ward 8, and I'm on the Steering Committee. Good evening. Joe Spidell. work at UVM. I live in Ward 3. My name is Vidur Dahal. Um, we have recently opened up a shop just nearby, so I'm here to um, provide some information about it, but I live in Colchester. Sorry to be here, but <laughs> I thought this is a good opportunity for yeah. us to because we are part, we have, we are part of this community because of the salon that we have recently started. So, um, thank you for the opportunity. Welcome. Hi, I'm Lisa Kingsbury. I'm with UVM Planning, Design, and Construction. Hi, I'm Jim Barr. I live in the Old East End on Chase Street, and I'm the DPW Commissioner for Ward One. And Brenner, Ward 8. Uh, Bill Church, Ward 8. Nancy Kirby, Ward 1. Karen Long on the steering committee, and I have bright cards to keep us on time. Uh, Richard Hilliard, I live on High Grove Court. Happy New Year. Tom Garrett, I live in Ward 1. Zariah Hightower, Hildred Drive off of Riverside, Ward 1. Caitlin Halpert, Loomis Street, Ward 1. Brian Sewell, Loomis Street, Ward 1. Dave Colley, Nash Place, in the Old East End. Patricia Seelan, Nash Place, Old East End. Hi, I'm Linda Risby. I live on Hungerford Terrace, um, Ward 8, Steering Committee. Vine Crandall, East Avenue. Martha Lang, Colchester Avenue. Pick him when you run with Cito, Ward 7. I'm Jason Williams. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations here at the UVM Medical Center. Adam Hodge, Ward 8. Jane Stromberg, 31 Hunger for Terrace, Ward 8. Sandy Wynn, Mansfield Ave, Ward 1. Linda Sheehy, Mansfield Ave, Ward 1. Charles Winkleman, uh, College Street, Ward 1. So again, welcome everybody. It's great to have such a large group here on a cold evening. And um, we're going to do something about the, uh, the budgets for, for the two neighborhood planning assemblies uh, before we get into speak out. And speak out will be a time when you to make announcements and uh, speaking about your new business and um, other meetings and other things that you want your neighbors to be aware of. But oh, I'm going to pass it over to Jonathan, who's on the steering committee, to talk about budgets. Thanks, Cindy. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, you may recall a couple months ago, uh, Ward 8 and Ward 1 kind of uh, set up some budget committees. The, uh, admittedly, the Ward 1 budget committee was the steering committee, um, and Ward 8 had a couple people from outside with the idea of trying to figure out how to spend the money, uh, the, the, the kind of windfall money we got this year, $2,500 up from the $400 that, that each ward would get, has gotten in the past. 
And so the wards put together a proposal, but it's still it's very drafty. Um, and uh, what I was hoping we could do tonight is kind of talk through the, the uh, first of all, we only have a few minutes, but, but talk through the lists and describe very generally what the items are and what they'd cost, and then kind of get a show of hands by ward, just yays and nays, you know, yeah, no, to see how the group feels about it. And um, excited for a healthy habit change. Um, and, and then we'd, we'd move from there. And one of the things we may want to do at the end of this process is just ask if uh, the, the steering committees can, can start spending some of this money, because in actual fact, we are already spending the money. There's, there's been food at, at all our meetings, and that comes out of this budget. So uh, let me pull up the list. This is, this is the, uh, the drafts that we've created. Um, there's a number of items here, and I'll read through these items. This is kind of what we think the total cost is. This is what, what Ward 1 thought about putting toward it, and Ward 8 talked about to putting toward it. And you might see some discrepancies. We'll talk through those. Um, but uh, just to start with, can Could I make a suggestion that we focus on the first column of the, uh, the items yes. and how important those are? And the numbers maybe are less important. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. Can I just have a, we'll do a little practice. Can I have a show of hands of the Ward 1 people in the room? Yeah. And can I have a show of hands of the Ward 8 people in the room? Okay. And, and anybody who, who doesn't know, because it's, it, there's no shame in that, the words are complicated. So, yeah. So, where do you live for? Uh, I thought of Riverside. Ward 1. But, but it's Ward 1, right? Yeah. And well, so, uh, are you saying one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, welcome to Ward 1. <laughs> okay, so let, let's start with food at meetings. And we budgeted this. Uh, for thir about $1,300 for the year shared between the wards. That's approximately $100 a month. We'll spend less in some months, and maybe in other months we'll have a, it'll be a little bit fancier, but $100 is about the going rate that we've been doing. Could I hear war, could you, not hear, can I see, and, and I'm hoping somebody, another steering committee member will, thank you. Uh, ward, ward one yays. Yeah, to keep this as a budget item on that order, that number order. This isn't going to be a this isn't going to be precise. I'm just waiting for uh, for Karen to. Uh, we, we need we need yeah, it's more impressions, but. Are we going by no, no, I think we're just getting a sense. It's not, a, the, the absolute numbers are probably not as important as if, you know, everybody says no, we want to know that. And ward 1 nays. Okay. Uh, ward 8 yays. Okay. Ward 8 nays. Okay. Uh, wireless microphones. There was one. Wireless microphones, we're, um, Cyril has been doing a fantastic job of working out all the bugs in the system and um, and right now, as of this moment, it feels like the microphones we have in this room are going to work fine without squealing and screeching and um, maybe we'll be able to do with what we have. And so what you'll see is, is um, Ward 1 and actually zeroed this out based on Cyril's recommendation. Ward 8 kept it in. We think that it's worthwhile to keep a, a, um, a placeholder here, probably at around $500, um, and it would be used either for microphones, it could be put towards um, s streaming as that technology, as we can develop that technology, or it could be, wor um, it could be uh, something like a donation to Channel 17 for the tremendous work that, that's done to get these, these uh, pro the programming on the air and online. Um, so it's more of a communications item now that we will work through as to what it was, what it would be. Um, the Ward 1 yeas. Ward 1 nays. Empty house. Good. Ward 8 yeas. Ward 8 nays. 
um, parties, block parties, community gardens, some kind of community activity that would probably happen in the spring. Um, we're thinking probably spending something on the order of $600 per ward. They'd be spent separately. There will be a ward one, there will be ward one activities and ward eight activities. Um, ward one yes. Ward one nays. Great. Ward eight yes. Ward eight nays. Um, speakers, guides, uh, and we th stipends maybe for having special guests come and talk, or guides to offer tours of Centennial Woods or the Intervale or something like that. Um, we thought maybe that would come to something like $250 shared between the wards. Ward one yes. Ward one yes. Ward eight yes. Ward eight nays. Okay. Um, physical signs or posters to announce meetings and connect the NPA to the community. Uh, we don't expect to spend a ton of money on this, but it may be that it would be there would be some way that we can do a little more publicity. Um, this might also include something like a donation to Front Porch Forum, uh, who do a huge amount of our communication for us. Uh, so this is another kind of communication uh, line item. Uh, at about $100. Ward 1 yes. Ward 1 nays. Ward 8 yes. Ward 8 nays. Okay. Um, so the question comes up, we want to serve more food, um, but we want to do this in some kind of a responsible and sustainable way, and two, two alternatives come up. One would be to actually purchase reusable dishes, and somebody on the steering committee, probably the person standing behind the microphone right now, would take them home and wash them. Um, but, but if they're reusable, I, you know, I, did a, I did a little scan of goodwill and resource, and I don't think there, I think we could come up with a bunch of plates really inexpensive that we could use over and over and over again. Um, the alternative would be by compostable plates. Um, and, um, and if we did that, it might be a little more expensive, but it might be a little easier also. So we're talking about up to maybe about $250 share between the wards. And um, can we just have a show of hands by ward for uh, reusable, compostable, or maybe something else altogether? Um, Reusable? Compostable? Yeah, both? <laughs> Something else? Throw them away, just you know, burn them in the dump. Bring your own plates. Okay. Okay, Let's, uh, we'll, we'll make a note of that. Um, and then, and then finally, um, on kind of on the same line as that would be if, uh, if we, we got a set of water bottles with the NPA logo on them, the words 1 and 8 NPA logo, lo logo, we could hand them out, and then we wouldn't, br or it could be a sticker, it could be somebody, somebody else's, yep. Um, and, uh, but then we wouldn't provide any cups either. We would probably just rely on everybody. We could, we could bring drinks, but let everybody bring a container that they drink out of. Um, who, who, who among Ward 1 think maybe we should get some logo water bottles? How about stickers? Who don't, okay. Uh, who, who don't think we should do that? <laughs> Uh, that's you've spoken. Any any other kinds of uh, logo materials like hats or anything else that um, may just be publicity for the for the wards around town? Any interest in that? Raise your hand if you're interested. Got it. That's the list we got. Thank you very much. Do you want to take two minutes to get ideas from the group or for anything we've missed? Yeah, so maybe, maybe what we could do is in, in uh, speak out, if people have ideas of other things they might want to see, just do it in the course of the speak out. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, Thanks. so that's a great transition to speak out, where uh, speak out is the opportunity to, to make brief comments, um, announcements, and um, uh, about meetings or new things going on in the neighborhood. And you, sir, said that you had an announcement, so let's start with you. Uh, one or two. 
Thank you very much. My name is Bidur Dahal. Um, we originally came to Vermont as a former botanist refugee resettled here in Vermont in 2011. And me and my wife have been working hard. And my wife went to cosmetology school. And um, since November, we have started a campus hair salon right across the street near 95 Colchester Avenue. And um, we came with an 18-year-old, 18-month-old uh, uh, child. And we had a one child here in the UVM Medical Center, one little girl. Both of them are now my little girl is six years old. My son is nine years old. And um, so I work at UVM, uh, UVM at a program under pediatrics department called Berman Land Program as an educational coach, outreach professional. Uh, I'm from Putinese Nepali community background. I come from that background. So um, I am here. I saw the announcement on the front porch, and it was very helpful for me and for my wife to come here and uh, announce about it. Um, and I would like your help to um, you know come and uh, spread the word of um, uh, you know about our salon from. About and help us to grow. Uh, I have come with the uh, um, you know, visiting cards. Please take one. I'll come around uh, or I'll leave on that um, front. Thank you. Uh, and please stop by. Um, my wife will be working there. I'll be assisting her on and off, but I'm not doing any uh, cosmetologist work But because I'm not trained for that. But I'll be certainly helping her. And I, we have been. Uh, it's it's been a great neighborhood. Thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity to announce it. Please, you are all welcome at the campus at Salon. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah. So, who? Let me just get a show of hands of how many people want to speak and speak out. People have announcements. Okay. So we, what I'm going to suggest is we start back here with you, Mark, and then then we'll bounce, sort of go uh, zigzag across the room. What's up, one eight family? I wanted to um, just uh, sh share with you just one uh, event that's happening. Um, on the 20th at uh, Arts Riot, uh, myself and Reverend Arnold Thomas uh, from the uh, Good Shepherd Church of Jericho are going to be presenting um, um, a, a version of a, a thing that we're doing across the state. I guess I have two things, um, which is um, hidden in plain sight. Uh, what we're calling this one is, is make it, uh, the making of a game changer. Uh, it's it's a really action oriented. Um, we're we're going to be showing a video uh, from Hey Sharon. <clears throat> we're going to be showing a video from um, uh, Trisha Rose, who's a who's the um, the chancellor's um, dean of um, uh, professor of uh, pro, uh, Africana studies at, at Brown University, and she's just really tremendous on systemic racism. So I just want to invite y'all out if y'all want to go and actually do something on MLK Day and actually get engaged and in, um, in, uh, kind of hone some skills to, to make a change. Uh, uh, Reverend Arm Arnold Thomas and I are going to be presenting that. And the other thing is is that there's also, just check Facebook, because if it's on Facebook, it's true, right? Um, just check on Facebook and see the, um, see the series. We're doing a, a community, uh, community forum series around the state called Hidden in Plain Sight, uh, the truth about his, uh, systemic racism, and that's in conjunction uh, with the liftoff that we're doing at the State House on the 15th. Thanks. And could you show hands again? Yep. Um, just for those of you who don't know, my name is Rahe Tower and I'm running for City Council in Ward 1. My flyers are up top if you want to grab one and happy to answer any questions afterwards. And then in regards to the budget, um, I'd love to see some more advertising spent instead of just for, I religiously follow Front Porch Farm, but I know a lot of my friends who don't. Um, and I think it'd be great to have bigger meetings um, and have more people here. So also expanding the food budget, I know that is really helpful in other wards in terms of getting people out. If we can have the main dish, and then maybe people bring sides or drinks. Right. And any thoughts that people have in terms of other ways to get the word out? We're all ears. 
Thanks. Uh, I'm Dave Cawley. Uh, another idea for the budget would be to, um, I, recently we did a survey uh, and uh, used SurveyMonkey, and there's a, there's a fee to use that. And so, but having that service available, they're really easy to put together, really easy to get the uh, results. So a lot of times there's issues that come up here that we could be like quickly uh, getting feedback from the community. So I recommend uh, maybe a subscription to that. That's a great idea. Maybe something we can work with CEDO and have it not just for our awards, but for other awards as well. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Liv Pena again. Um, I live in Ward 1 and I am part of a group called the Greater Burlington Women's Forum. And so we're a group that hosts events in the Burlington area and they're not just limited to folks who live in Burlington and they're not just limited to women. So we are having an event tomorrow during lunchtime from 12 to 1.30 um, in the auditorium in City Hall. And the event is focused on um, the Winter Blues, which is uh, more officially known as SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. And so this is an event that's gonna have a panel of three experts um, of various different um, in involvements, I would say, with um, SAD. So come on down, um, bring your lunch. There's gonna be a comedian there as well to make light of <laughs> a tough time of year. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Haji, and I'm officially running for school board Ward 8. So you'll be seeing me around your neighborhoods. And um, again, I really do value the NPA meetings, um, just getting together and seeing what neighbors are up to. So again, I'm gonna be running for Ward 8 um, school commission. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Stromberg. I'm a Ward 8 resident. I live on 31 Hungerford Terrace. Uh, an idea for um, turnout for these nights, maybe we could have a designated person do some reach out and be in charge of the media to gather uh, more folks here. And another very important thing, I am running for Ward 8 City Council and I have some literature I'll be leaving up front, but I'll be here after the meeting to talk more with folks. And uh, yeah, all right, thank you very much. Thanks. January 18th is uh, the Vermont Women's March, and the main event will be indoors at Castleton. But they'll be streaming all across the state at all kinds of uh, facilities from houses on up. So you'll be further information coming, but put it on the calendar, 18th. Anybody else? Richard. Thanks. Uh, I heard a rumor, and I wonder if Sarah can confirm it, but I heard a rumor that um, you've got a fixed date, Sarah, uh, on Channel 17 for the telecast of this meeting. Is that correct? Um, I heard um, Jared Wood. <laughs> Jared Wood asked the question, and I passed it on, and my recollection is that it was something like Sunday afternoon, oh, excuse me, uh, he was looking for evenings. Sunday, so Sunday was 1 to 3 is what I oh, heard. Okay. So you, you, I'm sorry. So it sounds like other people know better than myself. I'd have to look back at the email. Um, if, if it's correct, I understand that uh, thanks should be due to you, uh, and it would be great if it would be published on Front Porch Forum every, every month. And, and also, you're probably aware that within a couple of days, so... Um, Friday, say you should be able to see it online, you know, at the 17 website. But it sounds yeah. like you're helping me remember. Yeah. Um, I think you said one to three on Sunday afternoons. It's on the cable. Now, so, so we'll we'll look into that and, and publish on the Front Porch Forum and also the NPA website when one can see it on cable and uh, information on how to stream it because it, it's accessible 24/7 online after a certain point. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, just a very quick announce announcement for folks who uh, may be at the State House uh, next uh, Wednesday, January 15th, we uh, have the Homelessness Awareness Day. It's a statewide event. Um, at the State House, we have a memorial vigil and speak out at noon on the State House steps. Uh, and we invite uh, all, all Vermonters to come uh, honor folks who have lived without housing over the last year. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. 
uh, not necessarily related to the budget, but on the idea of getting more people to these events. Uh, I know Ward 2 and 3 does a Facebook event um, to help remind people and keep it on their calendars, and that's something we should consider as well. And we've been continually trying to figure out how to, to live stream these so that people at home can, can participate in real time. We're still working on it, hoping that the, university, uh, the hospital has been very helpful in, in seeing how they can make that happen. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, so another announcement is that uh, the, it's come up that there's a forum uh, for city council members next uh, in February, and that's the same time as the, the NPA meeting ordinarily would be, the second Wednesday of the night. So that'll be at the YMCA, and uh, we'll, um, uh, so we won't be having a regular NPA meeting in, in February. Okay. And I saw somebody pointing over here, there's another, uh, oh, so, oh, sorry. So again. Thank you. I just have a question about the YMCA in general. Is there any plan to move the NPA meetings to the, the community room at the YMCA? Um, I don't think the steering committee has, has thought about that, but it's a great idea. We've been, been wondering about how, um, you know, where we should meet. A lot of people really like this space. Um, others uh, have concerns. What's that? No? It's not big enough. It's not big enough. <laughs> we'll, we'll look, the steering committee will we'll get back to, to, to the group on Okay, and I think we have, well, we'll, we'll look into it. It's a good idea, yeah. Um, so, the, did you have something? No. No, okay. Ah, so, uh, the city councilors ordinarily take a bit of time to give us an update. They've graciously ceded a, a bunch of their time to the uh, state representatives because we don't get to have them here that much. But I understand that, that Sharon and Jack want to speak briefly, particularly about, uh, I forget what now. <laughs> okay, good. So um, I am actually now Adam Roof because he sent a text and he is ill tonight. So, um, but he was at the public safety committee meeting earlier and they were discussing the city's sheltering on public lands um, and the policies about outreach and removal of, um, of encampments that are either illegal, prohibited, or those that are not prohibited. Um, he didn't give any details about those policies, but that was the discussion tonight. And that's been a very important topic for many of the people that live in those encampments. Um, the other thing he wanted to mention was that um, regarding UVM housing, um, that he's um, working on a plan of action to move forward with discussions um, regarding um, this housing, pro UVM housing, realizing that um, that would result in a net increase of undergrad beds. And um, I'm going to paraphrase this, so Adam, forgive me. But a few things he wanted us to all remember. It's a responsibility that the city administration negotiate the new agreement. Um, and that um, no project will move forward without support from UVM administration and the majority of the 25 um, member board of trustees. Um, and that, um, let's see, while, while frustrating, UVM does not make decisions like the city does, and um, to ignore that is a mistake. Um, anyways, he looks forward to being part of these conversations in the future. Um, and I know that's a hot topic for all of us. Um, I'm going to be even briefer. Um, now, I'm speak now I'm speaking for myself. Um, I wanted to let people know that as part of the Ordinance Committee, the Ordinance Committee is working with um, the Planning Commission. And um, last, on Monday night, this um, at the City Council level, we looked at the ordinance that was passed out with accessory dwelling units in a nutshell. Owner occupied, no parking required. Maximum size, 800 square feet. It can occur anywhere in the city. 
any zone except RCO and, and Urban Reserve, but any any uh, any zone. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, we'll they'll be back on our agenda on the 21st. On the 14th, next Tuesday at 6:30, the Joint Ordinance Planning Commission meeting will take place, and one of the big topics is going to be short-term rentals. Um, the other issue that I just wanted to hit um, briefly before we go over to the legislators is the issue of Amtrak. Um, so Amtrak is slated to return passenger service to Burlington in 2021 or 2022. Yes, I'm glad. I'm glad someone cheered for that. It is. It is very exciting, um, and I hope we don't lose sight of that. However, there are a lot of different complications that that come with that, um, and and a lot of uh, logistical challenges and difficulties around. Um, where to overnight the trains and, and service them and store them overnight, but also the way they impact um, Vermont Rail's operations, um, which happen just kind of south of, of Union Station at the bottom of Main Street. Um, so there's a lot of negotiation. We just had in executive session, uh, the city council on Monday was strategizing how to negotiate here, but there's the state legislature plays a role, Vermont Rail Systems, who has a 50-year lease, and so essentially they control that land and they're demanding a second track be placed on that section, which would pretty significantly impact the waterfront, especially the bike path right in there. So there's a lot of moving parts uh, going on right now that we're trying to negotiate. Um, one meeting that I will mention that's important is next week on the 16th, um, we're going to have a meeting with the two committee that I serve on, Transportation Energy Utilities, and that's where we've been doing most of the discussion around this issue. We're meeting on the 16th at 6 p.m. at Riverside Apartments um, to discuss the possibility of doing the overnighting um, and servicing of the Amtrak station down next to the McNeil biomass plant. That's one of the possible options. Um, the other main option that's been discussed is doing it right at Union Station. Um, so it's a little hard to summarize that issue, but that's an important meeting. Um, and City Council is going to be taking, most likely, um, taking a position on you know where we would like to see the Amtrak service in overnight and potentially taking position about this second track discussion as well. Um, and we, we have a deadline to, to do that and make our voice heard by mid-February. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks to all of you, Councillors. In, in absentia. Um, so I'm going to pass it on here. We're just going to keep moving because we've got so much to cover. Um, we have our state representatives here to give us an update. Uh, Brian said that because he, he was here last time, he, he probably won't be involved in the update so much, but is here to answer questions. So we'll, we'll get brief updates and then uh, an opportunity for you to ask your reps questions about this session or beyond. So, Chris. Hi, everybody. Uh, Chris Pearson. I'm one of uh, the state senators for here in Chittenden County. I live down on Brooks Avenue. Nice to see you. Um, we don't have a lot of time, and there's literally hundreds of issues we could talk about, but i um, open to questions maybe after. Uh, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about the uh, Legislative Climate Solutions Caucus. I uh, founded the caucus. I was one of the co-founders in 2012, and I've recently found myself uh, back as co-chair. And this summer and fall, we set up a process really uh, increasingly frustrated that we weren't making enough progress in the legislature. So about 40 of us met in May, um, as Selena and Brian are part of that, and started a working process where we, uh, we charged folks with coming up with an agenda that was achievable in the four and a half months that we're meeting. In other words, we could get from start to the governor's desk and would be significant. Um, and we had a, a, a large, large process that went into that. And we then, this fall in October, November, December, went around the state and talked to the public about it, trying to galvanize some energy and, and sort of uh, corral activists. You know, climate solutions are 
um, challenging because no one's ever done it. And you can't just say, well, do what Oregon's done, and then you're good. You know, there, there are little pieces that you can collect from around the world, but there's no uh, one single agenda that gets you there. So it is, can be hard to also corral activists. In, in the, the short story is we have an agenda, sort of a five-part agenda. Um, transportation, that's the biggest uh, source of emissions for Vermont. Um, uh, building efficiency, that's the number two. Uh, energy efficiency, uh, changing efficiency of Vermont that only works on electricity, but to all fuels. Uh, increasing our dependence on renewable energy, our mandate to utilities. And finally, accountability. Um, we have had statute, goals in statute of reducing emissions, they've been um, uh, sort of things were aspirational. We're going to make those or some version of those law uh, keyed in the short term to Paris and by 2050 joining New York and Maine to hit a net zero standard for the state, make them mandatory and give an accountability to the public for holding the state accountable, so uh, a citizen right of action in that. So that, that's a very broad agenda, and I don't have enough time to get into it, but that is um, you know, something that we think is in many ways foundational, something we can build on going forward. Somebody said, it's like we're in the first inning of the game. You know, of course, we should be uh, <laughs> well into the series by now, unfortunately, but, um, but this would be foundational. The transportation is a 12-state agreement, potentially. All of the Northeast, that's about a quarter of the country's economy uh, with a, a cap and invest system for transportation fuel. So, so some really um, things that we can build on in years to come, but would set us down the path to really try and tackle this. Obviously, we've got to reform our economy um, to get away from fossil fuels. So, I'm working on a lot of things, but that has been something um, I know a lot of pe the public's interested in, and, and if people have questions, I'm happy to try to address them. Um, there's a lot of other issues, but I'll turn it over to Selena for now. Well, I'll say, um, you. so I'm Selena Colburn. I'm a um, former city councilor, but now a representative with Brian Sheena, my district mate for Chittenden 6-4 district. And uh, we, you may recall that we ended the legislative session somewhat abruptly last year um, when the House and the Senate could not come to agreement on paid family leave and minimum wage increase bills. So we have those bills in front of us right now. We just went back yesterday. Um, today we sent the paid family leave bill to a conference committee. I think um, some advocates and some of us have concerns that that bill um, needs to go further than it does, but the, now the Senate and the House will hash that out, and then um, we, at some point, will be voting on a minimum wage increase that's now um, keyed down to a two-year increase that gets us to, I think there's going to be some adjustments made, but I think it was like 1250 in two years was the original proposal, and then we'll, we'll do some continue to work on that. So those bills are moving forward. We also have some bills that were vetoed by the governor at the end of last session. So we have a bill that would allow Vermonters to um, have, when toxic polluters are the cause of known potential health hazards and harms, the idea is that they would be able to be held account accountable when people needed ongoing medical monitoring to assess um, the development of, of conditions. And that was a bill that the governor be vetoed. We're kind of right on the edge of being over able to override that veto. So there's some work happening there. There was also a firearms waiting period. Um, Bill that was vetoed, and I think we're we're well short of the votes, unfortunately, to override that. So those are some of the things that are like right back with us. Um, I serve on a judiciary committee in the House, and so a lot of the work that I'm doing in my committee this year is looking at criminal justice reform for the state. Um, and we're, there is also in the House and in the Senate a corrections committee. And given all of the revelations that came have come to light about our corrections 
system, I know that those committees are immediately taking up the question of um, what's happening in our correction system, what's happening with guards, what's happening with oversight, um, and I think that will be a long ongoing conversation. We've also had a couple of groups really looking at the whole system of, of justice in Vermont that have made some recommendations. So one is something called the Sentencing Commission um, that's come up actually several times over the years, but they, they've come back with some recommendations about really looking at a more comprehensive system of how we classify crimes, um, really just revisit, revisiting a lot of our criminal code and really with the net effect of reducing sentences um, overall. And then we've also had a consultant group um, who's looking at what they're calling justice reinvestment in Vermont, and they're making a number of proposals. One of their key findings has been that over, over half of our incarcerated population in the state are people who are back on violations of fur, furlough, parole, or probation. And in the case of furlough, like the vast majority of those violations are technical violations. So it's people who've been sort of in one way or another um, placed in community supervision and then, you know, maybe they miss a curfew, maybe they relapse with drugs or alcohol, maybe their um, approved housing falls through and they're reincarcerated. So we're really looking at um, some much needed changes to that system as a way of reducing our prison population. And then there's, there are lots of individual bills in my committee that I could talk about, including some um, racial justice initiatives, including domestic violence initiatives, including um, we just today we're in my committee we're looking at trying to draw cleaner lines between sex work and sex trafficking. Um, and, but like Chris said, we, we don't have a lot of time and I think we really want to hear from you and hear your questions and thoughts. So. So I think, so um, this works better if you turn it on. Um, let me get a sense of how many people have questions for, the, for these folks. Um, Mark, Sharon, that's it? So we're going to start with, with the civilian. <laughs> Um, I had a question for Chris about some of the things you were talking about um, around climate. Um, and if there's anything that you're discussing around how to reduce the impact of animal agriculture in terms of methane emissions, pollution, and things like that. So I, I happen to serve on the Senate Ag and Forestry Products Committee, um, the vice chair, actually. Um, and so we are looking at that. Um, just today, we were talking about uh, feed additives, which is kind of an emerging um, solution around particularly cows, and cows burp a lot of methane. And methane is uh, several times as potent as carbon. Um, so this is actually a significant issue for, for Vermont. Um, we've also set up a process where uh, we're trying to look at um, getting, well, this is a little off topic, but in the ag and forestry sector, um, getting state forest lands into uh, carbon markets, the potential to do that, which would protect our forests. Um, potentially stop deforestation and, and uh, breaking up of habitat. And also set up a committee where we're about to get a report back on so-called ecosystem services. So this is the idea that uh, a farm, you know, in a simple way, we've been paying farmers for one ecosystem, typically in Vermont, making milk. And so every ounce of energy and dollars that goes into that farm is to maximize milk. and. Uh, along the way, we're depleting soils, we're creating runoff that's polluting the lake, and on and on and on. So the concept is gaining steam is, is could you reward farmers for building soil um, and uh, thereby creating a carbon sink, creating flood resilience, um, reducing runoff. Um, and so we're trying to get our arms around what kind of a solution that would be. Um, I will say I'm sort of new to the ag sector. Uh, I think strategically, you need to be. We need to be thinking. We are. We are thinking of incentives as 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 opposed to mandates. Farmers are are a stubborn bunch in some ways. In many ways, they're very independent. They like to be left alone and 
and we need farmers badly. Three quarters of our open land in Vermont is controlled by dairy. Dairy, as we all know, is not a uh, promising economic prospect. So we need to protect that open land. We need to keep it working. But the idea that Montpelier can you know, come in and say, you got to do X, Y, and Z uh, is tricky. It, it is very, very difficult. And we're already mandating a lot of changes on the ag uh, on farmlands because of water quality. So I've been really th focused on the sort of incentives. How do you pull people in as opposed to trying to push them, if that makes sense. Ecosystem services, I got to say, is, is one of the more promising solutions that we're looking at. And after all, we're spending millions, tens of millions of dollars on clean water. And we're depending on the ag sector to deliver a lot of that cleanup of phosphorus reduction. and. Uh, bizarrely, the Secretary of Ag has not been in there demanding a commensurate amount of, of clean water money. And a lot of us are saying, <laughs> why wouldn't we invest in farms to make it easier for them to partner with us on clean water in particular? Most of that were, would also have a carbon sink benefit. Um, and you don't get very far down that road before you start looking at confinement operations for large feed operations, you know, it's totally unsustainable. We're in a, a moment where we're trying to reduce phosphorus runoff into the lake. We are importing phosphorus into the state of Vermont for feed for animals. It's ridiculous. Uh, but it is tricky to instantly turn, uh, turn around, to say the least. Mark? Thanks. <clears throat> hey, thanks, y'all. Thanks for serving. Um, I was in the state house today, um, and it was so calm, and I was just wondering what the hell's going on up there, because um, it's usually such such a zoo. I guess it starts tomorrow. Um, it data, won't be calm Selena. tomorrow, that's for sure. I'll, I'll be there for the governor's, uh, you know, uh, Selena. The H two eighty four. Uh, Got to talk about it uh, to those in the room. It's the it's the data bill. Uh, right now, we've been collecting up uh, uh, police data. Uh, Title 20, 2366. Um, and we haven't really been doing that very well on the back end, uh, which is why we came out with the uh, dashboard in, in November. Uh, but um, yeah, just wanted to know if you know, you're, you know, what that looks like. Uh, I think Justice Reinvestment, they, they definitely nailed us on data. And, and I think what everything I'm hearing is, is our data is the worst in the nation. OK? And um, those are the. I think what concerns me most about it, and first what, what we're talking about is we're talking about the rest of the criminal, <clears throat> so-called criminal justice system. Um, you know, in, in um, you know the state's attorney's offices, judiciary, and corrections. But you know, keep in mind we also have a racial equity executive director who's supposed to be collecting data across housing, education, employment, economic services, and uh, all the good stuff: health services, access. So we need a data infrastructure because that is what you use to make your decisions. And <clears throat> what has been happening up until now is, is, is that all of your, your reports have been basically spot reports and snapshots in time. And there's no trend analysis capabilities that you have except for if you got two reports side by side. You know? so, and we won't even talk about the mess of the 79 agencies of, of law enforcement. It is critically important that we get to data. So that's, that's one. Uh, and the other thing is, is um, I don't know whether any, either of you would be able to speak to this directly, but maybe indirectly is, is what about uh, cannabis uh, taxation and uh, regulation? You know, we just saw Chicago come out of the gate and they changed the life trajectory of thousands of people in eight days. And we can't seem to figure out how to do that in eight years with the legislation that we have proposed. Thanks. So I can, I can talk to the data bill and then, I don't know, maybe we could all talk to tax and regulate, but um, so there is a bill that I introduced with a number of other legislators working with the ACLU, working with Mark and others um, that calls for data collection kind of in, in all the stages of our criminal justice system. So that's the H-284 bill that Mark was referencing. So it really looks at when police are making arrests, when police are stopping people. We want that data and we want to understand who they're interacting with and how. When um, then prosecutors are charging people, we want to understand how that's working and if there are disparities there. 
when judges are sentencing people, we want to understand how that's working if there are disparities. And finally, we want to see who is actually ending up um, incarcerated. And it's true that we have just seen these point in time snapshots. So corrections often will come into my committee and give us a, like, here's who's incarcerated right now to, on a, typical day to answer a question, but then they tell us essentially you can't infer anything from this because it's just a point in time. So the idea of this bill is to try to overcome some of the bar barriers to a addressing the um, inequities in our criminal justice system where we're constantly being told, well, we just don't know where it's happening or we don't know why it's happening because we don't have enough information. I do think that this bill, at least as a vehicle, maybe not in its precise form, is going to see movement this year. So I think it'll probably be um, up in my committee, either this week or even or next. Like I think it's going to come up quickly, and I think um, the just the findings of justice um, reinvestment have been really critical to getting this bill moving because they their work, first of all, was delayed by the difficulties they had getting data about our criminal justice system. And then, yes, one of their final findings, I was just looking at their final report um, tonight, really calls out the data. We also had the opportunity to speak with um, Susanna Davis, right, who's the new director of racial equity for the state and yesterday in my committee, and she also cited the data issue, and we talked to her about that at length. So I think there is a critical mass moving forward on the, that issue. The question will be what form it takes, right, in terms of actually passing legislation. Um, tax and regulate. Boy, we keep hearing that it's like coming in, in the House. Um, at least from the House Majority Leader, I think the Speaker has is maybe a little more um, non-committal on it, just in terms of her personal support for the bill. But I, there is clearly a critical an, enough people to pass that bill in the House, and I, I believe there is every intent to pass it this year. That was really a racial so, equity and reparative question. Yeah, maybe I can try. Oh, what's the, the question? Well, so tax and regulate is sort of moving forward, but the question that I think Mark's referencing is people with a criminal record uh, for marijuana possession going in the past, and, and you know, we've ruined their lives, and you might argue, and, and now we're going to say, hey, enjoy this marijuana that's available down the street on the store. So I, I have a bill into uh, an automatic expungement bill. Um, it's in the Senate. I can't remember the number because we introduced it last year. Uh, and and I, it's a good reminder that I, I want to see if we can tee it up. I think that maybe wisely the two issues in terms of tax and regulate and expungement have been separated because tax and regulate is confusing and not confusing. It's, it's controversial enough on its own. I'll say tell you this is like a technical thing that we run into a lot. It seems simple, right? If you have a prior conviction of marijuana on your record, and now we've legalized marijuana, remove the record. It's not so simple. Um, so one of, the, one of the sticking points is we've legalized possession of up to an ounce, but you might have, possession, you might have a charge of an ounce and a half possession. And so they tell you, I said, OK, I want to file a bill to do this automatic. They said, well, it can't be automatic, because some poor schmo is going to go through every one of these files and see what the possession amount is, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, all right, that's never going to happen. We're never going to pay for staff to do that, and it's going to take too long anyway. So let's decriminalize possession of up to two ounces, and then you can expunge all of those records. And that sort of takes care. After two ounces, we've always been in a different category. So. So, which is to say, it's a little more complicated than just automatically doing that. But I think that that is the right direction. I know there's a lot of appetite to do this and not only do the half piece of it in terms of taxing and regulating, making it legal going forward, but cleaning up records for people whose lives have really been destroyed for a plant or, or deeply impacted uh, across the board. So I'm very hopeful we'll do that. 
I don't have a good read of whether or not we'll do that this year, but I I don't I think it's irresponsible to do them, you know, not at the same time. I think you got to have the honest discussion, and, and we're pushing for that. And we have two more questions, so I'm going to ask that uh, both the questioners and the responders try to to be concise. I don't want to cut you off with important information, but also I want to keep to the other stuff on the agenda. So Sharon and Jonathan, I believe. Uh, so. I have a couple of comments and, and a question for Chris, but the comment is um, I applaud trying to increase the minimum wage, but when we start, we have a goal, but by the time we get it passed, we've already fallen behind. And so I, I just, that's a frustration for me. And the minimum wage, a livable wage in the city has been linked to whether you have health care benefits or not. A, the minimum wage is not, and so once again, you're you're you know you're in a catch-22 depending on where you work, etc. So I just enough said. I just hope that people realize that it's so difficult to get anyone paid fairly. It's just so frustrating to me. But anyways, that's one thing. Number two is Anthony Polina tonight talked about taxing people that make over two hundred thousand dollars. And that money would be utilized, I believe, to address public transportation. But I wasn't certain. And is that a bill that's really moving forward? And could could and it's in the Senate. So could so could our senator speak to that, please? Thank you. Sure. I, I think just to the minimum wage, it's important to remember Governor Scott vetoed a fifteen dollar minimum wage a year and a half ago. So you know, so we are losing time. Um, the Polina deal, sometimes called the Green New Deal bill for Vermont, uh, looks at the fact that the Trump tax cuts gives wealthy Vermonters a huge, huge benefit and, and says, well, then we can have a little bit of that for our clear needs. I'm not sure that's poised to move immediately. It's, it's a good discussion for us to be having, and it is a good it is a good marker for when the legislature, I mean, I, I signed on to it, so I support it. But when the legislature turns and says, okay, where, how are we going to make investments for climate solutions, someone's going to say, well, how are we going to pay for it? And he's starting to start to have that conversation. So I think that's really important. He doesn't specify exactly how you would spend the money. He says, you know, it could be X, Y, and Z. Public transit is a clear one, and those of us in, here in Trenton County know that our bus system is is on the ropes, as it were. So, so I think so. I, I think it's a foundation moving forward, and I hope it will gain traction. Me too, because actually a lot of people have great ideas, and the roadblock is there's no financing for it. So if we can solve, have some pot of money for financing, we can maybe take some steps. Thank you. So we, we, did, did you want to comment? No? I just want to say, well, I'll, um, speaking of financing, um, something that you can keep an eye out for is that the Progressive Caucus in the House plans to work on a variety of suggestions of ways to raise revenue to fund some of these investments, and we can keep you updated. So, Jonathan, I'll keep it brief right now. As uh, one last question. Thank you. This is for Selena. I'm I'm interested. It's a question, then a couple of comments. Don't let sure. the comments distract the question. Uh, I'm interested in what you what you were going to say about um, domestic violence initiatives. Um, a couple of comments. One is, I, from the domestic violence standpoint, I, I hardly, from every standpoint, but from the DV standpoint, I hardly endorse Mark's work and the work on data gathering. It's very hard to get good data on domestic violence incidents, and, and we really need it. We need it across the state. The other is that, um, is that uh, Human Services wants uh, ge uh, general assistance money, the GA funding, to be administered locally which we think is a wonderful idea, but they, have, they, they don't seem to have a taste to pay for it. And um, the administrative costs just don't seem to go along with it. And I'm wondering if that's something also that might get work done as well. So as I say, don't let that distract you. I just, that's editorial. Thank you. Well, I might have more information. Um, I hate to presume here, but I sit in uh, appropriations. I'm a, a lobbyist for the Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, and uh, they're actually considering uh, in 
in the Appropriations Committee through the budget adjustment process, uh, $2.7 million additional ask for motel voucher budget, and that's um, really uh, bringing this conversation about uh, devolving the general assistance program to local uh, providers and not having the state, uh, while well, the state would still have a, a stake in it and fund it, um, but your concerns are, uh, I, I think, warranted, and it's going to be a discussion for the FY21 budget. Um, oh, did you want to answer that? I was just going to, did you, did you want a little more information on the domestic violence yeah. stuff too? So uh, I think we're looking at, we heard from a number of witnesses today about really looking at the whole landscape, but all, in, per, particularly focusing on um, an annual report that happens, it's called the Domestic Violence Fatality Review. Commission does an annual report, and so really um, looking at some strategies that have worked in other states that are things like um, creating intensive teams around high-risk situations, regional teams of providers. I think that's something there was a lot of interest in in the committee, but it takes resources. Um, and a number of other strategies and interventions that we looked at, are particularly around the relief from abuse order um, process, but we also are looking at firearms and continuing to look at the link between firearms, domestic violence, and, um, and particularly fatalities in domestic violence situation so we'll be looking re looking at a bill tomorrow that looks again at the question of what happens in those situations when firearms are present so that'll be part of our conversation but we're also looking at none for another a number of other um, sort of judicial and programmatic approaches so all I wanted to say before we end is that let the last MPA, someone asked um, about us posting updates. And so I wrote an update. It was too long for one post. So I posted part one today, and part two hopefully will be allowed to go out tomorrow, and I won't get like reprimanded for sending two in a row. Um, so if anyone wants a more detailed update about some of the things I've been working on, it's not everything, but it's some of the bigger things. It, it's on front porch form right now. Um, so I just want to let you know that in case anyone remembered from last time. We did indeed, and thank you very much. And also thank you, shout out to the Front Porch Forum, because it, it's just such a great way to communicate. So appreciate that, and we also appreciate that there's some people that don't communicate that way, so we're working on that as well. Uh, so thank you all, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> well, it's going to be hard to follow that. <laughs> um, so, uh, as you may recall, over the, over the last several years, the issue of, of housing has come up, and we only have a little bit of time, and we just get into what the issues are, and that's as far as we get. So, the steering committee has been talking about doing uh, a more concentrated uh, evening or set of evenings on housing, and Liv and I are just starting that conversation. I'm going to pass it over to Liv. I have, oh, I, have I, don't right, need, I hope I don't need to double microphone. I'm also going to stand in front because I don't want to have my back towards my friend Linda here. Um, so as Cindy said, um, at every meeting, housing comes up in some way, shape, or form, and there's just never enough time to talk about all the issues. And I think depending on what your role is um, in housing uh, or the way that you live in Burlington, whether you're a tenant or a homeowner or a landlord or um, anything in between housing impacts all of us. And so there's many ways that a broader housing conversation could look. So we really want to put it to you all and see what would you all like from a meeting focused on housing. Some of the ideas that we've bounced around have been related to um, tenant rights or um, UVM student housing or um, housing conditions. I also want to add that I'm a member of the Housing Board Re Review. So again, there are many different ways that this can look. So we're open to any and all ideas. I have a suggestion. Um, 
which is I feel like in the conversations that I've been involved in for a bunch of years now, particularly around student housing, one approach that doesn't come up enough, but I think that there's genuine interest in is cooperative student housing. Um, and so I think there's some really great and interesting models out there, but they're just not really being put in front of the student community to really think about and investigate and and then that community turns over, you know, within a four year period often. And so I just would really encourage looking at cooperative housing models um, for students as part of that conversation. I think there's a lot of potential there. Thank you. I would just suggest uh, making sure that you invite um, someone from Champlain Housing Trust uh, and or Raleigh Housing Authority, so you know, some local housing, affordable housing providers. And obviously in our area, um, student housing is a huge issue. Um, Selena may not know this, but 20 years ago, we had a couple of student housing co-ops. Um, I helped develop them, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't survive. Um, and one of the reasons they didn't was we actually went to the UVA Board of Trustees and asked them to help invest in those and invest some of their endowment in them um, to get a socially responsible rate of return, um, and they refused. Um, and eventually, the student co-ops folded. So, um, but it's definitely worth trying again. Yeah. Did you, you had a question? I just wanted to ask Selena if you could describe that student housing cooperative and how that works, and maybe you know as well. I think it has worked different ways in different communities, and others may know more, but sometimes the institution plays more of a role in hosting the housing and, and then students kind of form a functional cooperative around it. Sometimes it's more independently owned or run by students or even a nonprofit structure. Uh, but the idea is, you know, communal communal living space and um, I have that's similar to a dorm but but different, right? More self organized, more um, and it's come up a couple of ways for me, like that uh, when I was campaigning and Slade Hall, which was a long term, a long time sort of small communal housing situation on campus. Um, people really were like, we want more like this, and in, but we're having to fight to keep it. And then I also I remember talking to students um, at a time when we were really pushing kind of amenity rich, well, not we, not me, but some in the city were really pushing like downtown amenity rich, privately developed student housing. And students said, well, we want like East, De we want like East Avenue co housing, but for students, you know? So I just think there's, it's a, could be part of our discussion and part of our model, but there's a lot of different ways it works. So, so we're running late, so I'd ask you to be concise. Uh, all I was going to say is I think that the co-housing uh, option should be broad. I don't think it, I mean, I support it for students, but I think that I'm always surprised with the, a fair amount of development that's occurred recently, that there's no appetite apparently for any other co-housing project. We only have the one on East Avenue, and that model works really well, and they used to have a wait list. So um, I'm interested in that, but I'm also wondering, do we have, we've, we've acquired, or we've got a bunch of questions that people have put forward from this NPA, so is the goal to address those questions or are you trying to formulate new topics to address? I guess that's really what I'm asking the, both you and Cindy. Yeah. And I, you may have a different answer, but I think, think we're just trying to get a, our heads around how to get our heads around the, the, the myriad issues that are all interconnected and how to have a, a meaningful, full conversation that isn't just going off in tangents. So it need to be focused in particular areas, and we're just trying to f figure out how to do that. So sometimes it would, sometimes a room that would have like tenants housing, uh, co-housing, student housing, um, quality of apartments, and you could have little stations and people that would be that would it would involve more than one meeting, but you could have people go and then 
navigate and, and you could generate a real um, result from that input from all of us and then you might then prioritize that and have a invite people to solve some of the problems we've identified. I like those station approaches. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, um, as someone's lived in DC, I've always been surprised by how weak tenant protections are in Burlington. So I'd love to have a conversation around what, what, what some of those could be. Some of the things I've been talking to people about is right of first refusal or the right to um, repair and deduct. Um, and you know, there were two other organizations. I don't know if I need to say it since Charles is here, but making sure that the uh, Burlington Tenants Union is also part of those conversations. Thanks. We're running. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess it'd be important to know what is motivating the steering committee to talk about it um, and what the goals are before kind of formulating how uh, a forum might, uh, what a forum might look like, and to have it not go off into lot of, lots of tangents. Um, so I, I would be interested in, in knowing about that. And I'll just say one more thing on student co-ops, which is there's a national association of uh, students of cooperation that um, are a national association of student cooperatives. Uh, they're a great resource. There's really large co-ops in some of the large university towns. Uh, remember in Berkeley, uh, California, there's a, a multi-story student co-op owned and operated by students um, of cooperation. Um, and uh, also very strong in Madison, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Ann Arbor, a lot, of, uh, a lot of universities around have those. Um, so we have this sign-up sheet, and if you would like to shape the conversation, which is basically the aim of this little mini, very, very mini conversation, feel free to sign up. And if you want to add a little comment about what you're interested in as well, feel free. And we, we get that you've signed up in the past, and we have that list. We're just, uh, uh, we just have spent a little bit of time not, not getting this done because of the holidays and other, other stuff going on. But, but we do have the list from two months ago, I believe, and um, appreciated people's energy. And briefly, to speak to your question with the steering committee's interest, it's that there's a lot of interest in the room. There's a lot of interest in the community. Obviously, housing affects us all, and it affects the community in all myriad ways. And uh, so we want to um, look at that and see if there are things that we as a, as a group can, can do. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to suggest that we move on to what's next? What's next? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Would you do that? No. We forgot something at the beginning of the meeting. So. Uh. All right. Um, if, you if you recall from last month, um, we are seeking nominations for the Community Development Block Grant Committee. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail as to what it was because you were all here last month, I know. Uh, but it's uh, it's the uh, briefly the CDBG is the advisory committee to the to the city to distribute HUD money that that comes as a block grant to Burlington. There's there's two block grants to the state of Vermont. One goes to Burlington, one goes to everybody else. The advisory committee actually does um, make decisions, and those decisions are are. Uh, are, are held, the, the, the city, the mayor, the city council follows the, the recommendations of this committee. So it actually is a committee with teeth. Um, and we need one representative on the committee from Ward 8 and one from Ward 1. And why don't we start with Ward 8 because it's, because there's probably only one person in the room. No, um, it was, was there somebody from Ward 8 who was interested in, Hannah, is there anybody else? Uh, would somebody from Ward 8 put Hannah King's name into nomination? That would be Keith. Is there a second? Any further? Is there any second? Or do we, we got to two people from Ward 8? Okay, and Brian. Um, all those in fo favor of Hannah being on the CDBG for Ward 8, say aye. I think I heard unanimity on that. Um, okay, Ward 1. And you are? Rebecca Roman. Rebecca Roman. Is there anybody else who's interested? I am, but you know, I'm not, you know, I could, could see to Rebecca. I, I, I don't see. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's just a matter of nominations. Yeah. You can ask that if you want. Can I hear a nomination? I nominate Rebecca Roman. Okay. Is there a second? 
Mark. Um, is there, are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all those in favor of Rebecca Roman, say aye. 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 Opposed? Yes. yes. Okay, Rebecca, congratulations. It's wonderful. It's a great thing to do. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have the uh, uh, some folks talking about the Riverside Avenue development. As you may recall, they were here a few months ago, I believe. No, 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 that was a different different Riverside uh, development. So we, we only have 10 minutes. I believe this is an introductory piece. You're not looking for uh, the NPA endorsement at, at this moment. You're just, but just doing a presentation. So um, if you could uh, uh, give us an overview uh, concisely, uh, that would be great and welcome. And there are some some summaries, if you're particularly interested, there are only 20 copies, but the, these, these are summaries of the proposal that you're about to present, and we'll post that on the NPA website. Good evening, I'll try and be brief as uh, we only have 10 minutes. Uh, my name is Benjamin Avery, I'm with Black Rock Construction in South Burlington, and uh, we, since 2015, have been a developer of a variety of senior projects across uh, Vermont, New York, and New Hampshire. Um, with the recent boom in senior care, which has been going on across the country, but in uh, in our part of uh, Vermont as well, we've seen a growth in the assisted and memory care sectors, um, which has really created an opportunity for some additional independent living uh, for lower acuity seniors who are really looking to maintain an independent lifestyle. Uh, we connected with the land owner here on Riverside Avenue uh, several years ago and wanted to explore the opportunity of bringing a market rate senior housing project to Burlington. We were attracted to this uh, particular location um, due to its proximity to the hospital, to downtown, and uh, to uh, businesses and services both in Burlington and Winooski, which are uh, easily located from, uh, from this site. This particular project is proposed to be between 55 and 60 units. Um, it is primarily a market rate project of senior apartments um, that will range in size from some smaller studios, maybe 600 square feet, up to 1,000 plus square feet, two bedrooms. Uh, I always like to stress that we prefer to build apartments, not units. Um, we really view independent living as uh, a transitional, uh, even though it is often a downsize for folks. Um, there will be a component, an affordable component of this project, so 15% uh, or a little more of the uh, apartments will be affordable. Uh, so we're really mixing in a, uh, a variety of housing options for a variety of incomes. We really view um, this type of housing as being very important in the community. Um, not just suburban communities, and we are enthused to bring um, a little more robust uh, programming to senior living um, as opposed to just apartments or age-restricted housing. So we do offer programming that includes activities, that includes wellness. Uh, all of our projects we build uh, physical therapy suites into, and we have third-party groups who are coming in and uh, working with seniors without having to go out and seek those services, as well as having full-time staffing to, to just generally uh, um, keep the facility moving along, keep the programs uh, moving along, and uh, to try and assist seniors with um, any needs they might have or questions or assistance facilitating things. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask Jeff to just quickly go over some technical details uh, of the project and um, uh, take it away. It's also a mic there if you want to. Hi, my name is Jeff Zoiber. I'm an engineer with VHB. Um, we're working with Ben Avery on this project. Um, and it's great to see this proposed senior housing located along Riverside. Um, I'm sure. Be, being that you guys live in this ward, um, or these two wards, you're familiar with the Riverside Corridor. There's a lot of apartments surrounding it to the south, east, um, and west, um, right along Riverside. Um, there's 
some aging buildings, especially um, to the north, just across the street. Um, there's some buildings that Riverside needs some of these older industrial buildings to kind of be replaced with newer modern um, apartment buildings and things that can support uh, Burlington's way of life. So the, the current parcel is nine acres, or sorry, nine tenths of an acre in size, um, and there's four units there that are gonna be replaced. Um, this is looking across the street, so it has a lot of infrastructure that seniors want. Um, there's a sidewalk on the south side, um, a shared use path on the north side, and um, bike lanes along both sides. So th there's a lot of infrastructure there that this, um, these units can take um, opportunity of. This is the closest um, building to the south owned by Burlington Housing Trust, um, and that's a, um, a Burlington Housing Authority, and it's a little storage shed. This is looking to the north, um, but that white building is one of the buildings on the parcel that will be developed. This is the existing conditions showing it's basically a gravel parking lot uh, in the middle with a, a few ho small houses around the side. And this is the, um, looking south from Riverside Avenue is, is the front, one of the proposed renderings. We're still working through some different um, it, configurations of, of the um, elevations, uh, but this is generally kind of consistent with what we expect to see um, along the Riverside frontage. This is from the northwest corner. This is flipping back to the existing conditions in the middle. Um, there's a lot of gravel pavement on site. Um, when the stormwater comes, it's flowing off of the asphalt roofs um, over the gravel and kind of eroding down the the middle to the to the north and passing over the sidewalk uh, directly into Riverside. So we think we can improve the stormwater, uh, provide some on on site um, both storage and treatment measures. Um, and, and this is looking back at, towards the site um, along that shared multi-use path uh, on the north side. We've been working with DPW, um, trying to figure out what infrastructure this project needs to construct and what what's there that can be utilized. Um, and th that's kind of a recap of the project. Um, it, it's, uh, I think it's a great location. Um, all the amenities and the infrastructure are there f for the city, um, but, but like I kind of said, um, some of those existing buildings along Riverside, it still needs to continue to be improved. So, so thank you for the preview, and uh, we understand that you're in the initial phases and that you'll be coming back uh, to get a design review from the, the, uh, the NPA once things come, get a little bit further developed in terms of your plans, is that right? Yeah, we've already been to sketch plan. Like as far as the form and the function and the number of units and configuration, um, this is this is pretty much it. Um, we still need to go through. Um, there's a lot of boards left. We're going to go to conservation board, um, this, um, the design advisory board, um, and then final BRB. Um, so we'll definitely keep the city of Burlington apprised of, of the progress. And there, there's, it isn't the, the last hearing that we'll be at um, um, as far as all the boards, but um, you know, as far as the MPA goes, um, this is pretty much how the building will, will end up being. Okay, we have a, hang on a second. We have a couple quick questions, but we, we want to have more time with you to talk more in depth about this. And right now we just have 10 minutes, so um, we'll have these questions be just basic and informational ones, and then we'll ask you to come back, okay? So do you have a date for the DRB yet? We haven't scheduled that yet. Okay. The second thing is that when uh, River Watch was put in, there was, um, there was known a, a dump site in that location, not where your housing is, I don't believe, you're, but I don't remember where it went, and I just want to alert you to that fact. I, I hope you've already been We've been alerted to that. that fact, and we're going to perform a phase one environmental assessment to make sure that we understand what the environmental implications are um, and remediate if need be. Okay, very good. Thank you. And then I just want to say similar concerns that I think were voiced in DRB. Now as a neighbor who would be living on Hildred Drive, you know, we'd love to see the front being a little bit more integrating with the Riverside Ave and also to the extent that you could have some kind of food service or something that could maybe even be open to the public so you've got that interface with the community, that would be absolutely great. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, gentlemen. And, uh, uh, apologies if we don't have more time now, but we we will be looking for, to have more of a conversation once you have a little bit more detail. So thanks.
So next up, we have a conversation about the India House. Uh, these two have been working actively on, uh, oh, is this Riverside? I think we had two, two questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you could be brief. Yeah. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I'm concerned about um, hulls and hitches is about ready to go into the Winooski River along with a few other pieces of property that have been in the paper with the landslide that we had from the October <coughs> Halloween storm. And I'm really concerned about the unstableness of that whole area. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know that they want to respond. Do you, do you have a response? Or? I think it was just more. We, we can offer that we are certainly you know aware of the surrounding area and on the north side. Um, this project it will address anything that needs to happen. We're, we're certainly aware of erosion control and things that need to be improved. Um, but but yes, we understand. And then I was just wondering if you could at this time speak to any. Um, sustainability initiatives for the building in terms of energy consumption or materials or anything like that? It, 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 we haven't gotten to the architectural level. Um, we're kind of working from the outside in. Um, a lot of the, the best energy efficiency things are w related to the mechanical equipment that'll go in there. We haven't reached that level of design yet. Some of the things that we have gotten to though, um, a lot of the parking will be underneath the building. So it's re re reducing that footprint of as exposed asphalt pavement to, to the extent practical, um, and then stormwater measures, making sure that we provide treatment. So that's the things outside the building, but we haven't gotten to the specifics um, related to the inside of the building. And we'll be looking for those kinds of, uh, of finer tuned stuff um, when you come back. And, and where I, I can't speak to this specific building yet because we haven't uh, really engaged formal design, um, I can say that I think every building we've built in the last five years here in Chittenden County has been en enrolled in some level of Efficiency Vermont Energy Efficiency Program. And two or three years ago, we, we built one that won the award uh, for it. So we, we've that's a concern to us. Uh, this is a building that we will be retaining ownership of. So long-term energy efficiency is not just a, uh, a social mission. It is a, it's a economic practicality for us. Okay. Thanks. So we're gonna move on to the conversation about the India House. So take it away, Pat, please. Do you have a microphone? Does this work? It does if you turn it on. Here you go, take this one. Hello, hi. My name is Patricia Seelan. This is my husband and partner, co-mortgager, Dave Colley, and he's gonna operate the slideshow. Um, these are the results of the survey for the new business idea for India House. And this is a very brief little thing. Let me start my timer. So the current situation is that Indie House was a restaurant on the corner of East Avenue and Colchester. Most of you know it, if only to give directions from it. And the formal address is 207 Colchester Avenue, which was surprising to me. I thought it would be East, I mean, East Avenue. It was in operation for nearly 30 years, and it just closed its doors in late 2019. According to the realtor, I've been in touch with the realtor. According to the realtor, the strategy of the owners is to retain ownership of the property, uh, sell the restaurant equipment and the other existing fixtures inside those booths and tables for $10,000, to lease the space for $4,000 a month, and to request a five-year lease. There's no interest in selling the property. It's owned by United India. The realtor, which is Peter Yee of Yellow Sign, has had several calls, but no follow through as of this past Monday. I've talked with him a couple times. Cindy Cook has talked with him. And um, he's saying that nothing's happened yet. The origin of the survey is that uh, there was a discussion entry on Front Porch Forum December 5th by Jen Lazar. I don't know if she's here, but she lives in East Village. And she said, let's dream together about that corner and what we would do. So I jumped on, several people jumped on. I said to Dave, boy, it'd be great to find out really what our neighbors think about this space and what would, would they want. And he said, oh, I could do this with that monkey survey, survey monkey thing. 
So he put that together. We got some questions on it. I reviewed it. He re had some other neighbors review it. And then we posted it on Front Porch Forum. There were only 10 questions. We had 119 respondents, which I thought was pretty good. And uh, 93 of them completed the survey all the way. And most people live in this neighborhood. There are friendly neighbors or non-friendly neighbors. And 50% of the participants of those people who responded want to stay informed about what's going on. Speaking of which, we have a sign-up sheet here on the front desk, which set, uh, allows you to put on your email if you would like to have more updates about what's happening with this. I announced this survey at the MPA meeting. Cindy expressed interest, and we've talked also. So the key findings, oh, my page is out of order. There it is. Is that one, the restaurant is a good idea. People want some place to go to select um, their own food, to sit down, to connect. And only 10% said no to a food place. The second finding is that, excuse me while I rearrange my pages is that they want to dine in and a takeout. People want to come in, they want to sit down, they want to have a coffee, a brioche, something to eat for breakfast, and then they want to be able to take home something for dinner or lunch, which fits in really well with our neighborhood uh, configuration here with the college, the hospital, the ball games, all of that. Key finding three is they want a cafe. 48% said they'd like to have some type of cafe um, only 10, only 13% uh, said they wanted table service, which is like kind of go in and sit down with a menu and have somebody ser serve you. So people want to come in and get their own food and sit down and kind of an informal hangout kind of place. Key finding number four is that most of our neighbors are going to walk there. And a lot of them said, wow, I would love to be able to walk there and stop in and get my coffee, read my paper, talk to my neighbors on my way somewhere in the neighborhood whether it's here or to the college or down the road. Um, diverse opinions of preferred cuisine. That was kind of surprising to me that there were a lot of international requests, but nobody wanted pizza. And I think there was a pizza place there before. Okay, thanks. So some of you may remember that. Um, when they said cafe and bakery and this type of come in or take out or go, I thought about stone soup, muddy water, scout, August 1st, that kind of a friendly, informal gathering place. The themes, and this is something that, um, you know, you can look and see what food, what, num what words are larger and pop out at you that they want a quiet dining place. They want to come in, like I said, I'm going to say it again, they want to come in, they want to hang out, say hello to your neighbor, get something good to eat, something good to drink, and just be there. Somebody had put on every response, she wanted couches. I would like a couch, I would like a couch, I would like a couch. Like a couch. All right, all right, I got that one. But the second choice was to have some live music in the evening, and that would be more acoustical live music, like jazz, or blues or something like that, not necessarily rock and roll. Um, and local art on the walls. That came up often, that people want a local, local art, like a gallery type of place where they could have that outdoor seating. There are just so many nice visions of this corner and what it could be for us. Other business ideas, the other small percentage said, how about a laundromat, how about a bookstore? How about a produce market, like city market, a fitness center, affordable housing, bike shop, cafe, art gallery, once again. So that was our theme there. So what are steps have we taken? Um, I got the survey, and Dave helped me figure out how to put it into some kind of a readable format. And I communicated the results to, first of all, I went right to Campus Kitchen and said, hey guys, this is what's happening here. And they had expressed some interest in the past about expanding, but they are in a really tiny little spot. So I said, well, you know, here it is. This is what your neighborhood wants, and you already have the good food, and you would not have to do a whole lot in order to expand. And um, they said, well, when it came up, we talked about it. I talked to Rob, and then he said, 
I will go back and talk to Bill again. So that, that would be fantastic, I think, if they could do something in addition to what they have at Campus Kitchen. Um, second of all, I sent it to Peter Yee, the realtor, and then we posted it on our Front Porch Forum on December 26th. I talked to the realtor on Monday again, and he said, I work for the owner, and I will accept any new tenants. Ideally, it will be somebody your neighborhood likes, but I'm going to put anybody in there. I work for the owner. I said, OK. I said, how can we help you get the right person? He said, send them to me. Give them my name and phone number. I said, OK. Got it. Got it. Um, one of the issues was parking. Um, Jim Barr told me that. He sent me an email and said that um, the parking across the street there at Trinity has guest parking, so that's available. Sharon also contacted me, Sharon Bouchard, and said that the UVM Health Building, that one on that corner, that that may be a possibility, that it's, she's worked with UVM in the past, it, it's but now, owned by the hospital now. Yeah, but now it's owned by the hospital, and I have not followed up on it. Um, the holidays and illness intervened. So the next steps is that we're going to continue the survey to see what the students want. They'll be back, and the staff and the medical center personnel here. And we're going to share the results with others. I'm meeting with um, CEDO on Friday to talk to them about some other things as well as this. <coughs> and then I met with Cindy Cook. And Cindy had some ideas about who may know other entrepreneurs or restaurateurs who would like to do this. Um, vendors. You can get the results at uh, the front page forum, 2587, December 26th. You can add your information on the sign-up sheet. And please give Peter's name, peter at yellowsignvt.com, to anybody you know. But it's basically, it comes down to us. And do we want to manage to work together to get something in there that we want? Um, we have a vision, but it's up to us to put that energy behind it and contact everybody you know. I thought about contacting uh, City Market. Would, do they want to put it in a produce stand or the farmhouse group? They seem to be successful at starting restaurants. Somebody had mentioned a bagel place, whatever. So that's it. I'm out of time. Stop. Yes. Nine minutes, 19 seconds. So thanks. There's a sign-up sheet here. Sign so that if people want to keep, uh, keep abreast, they, they, yes. they, that will get to you. Yes. So I think it sounds like there's a lot of really interesting and diverse ideas, and I wonder if this could be a space that could house all of those. Um, um, like, I feel like pop-ups are really popular right now, or maybe they always have been, and I'm just starting to pay attention. But um, I wonder if this could be a space that it's a coffee shop, but they also have like a rotating residency where Monday it might be Maria uh, from Cafe Mama Juana, and then the next day it's um, Miranda or Louisa's pierogies or something. Um, I think there's a lot of options there, and I, maybe it's not just one idea, but maybe it's multiple of these ideas. I think so too. I think we have a lot of opportunity here, but we have to coordinate and join forces. Well, thanks for all your good energy and work on this. We really appreciate it, and uh, we'll probably we hope to be hearing good news down the road. Okay. Tell your Thank friends, you. Thank you. Neighbors. And there's a sign-up sheet here. <laughs> Um, so next up is f folks who are going to do a, another you. sort of flash preview about uh, a proposal on Hungerford Terrace. And uh, is that, I have that right? Yes? Yeah. Thank you. No, but, um, so you can use one of these chairs for a measle. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Bruce Baker, and this is Greg Doremus. And we have a property on Hungerford Terrace and this is this is Hungerford Terrace itself and see it's hard for you this street view is is looking north and way up would be the mobile station this is a property we own at um, 21 Hungerford there's a middle building at 11 Hungerford and then there's one at um, at fifth at uh, right so there's 11, 15, and 21 consecutively that we own. The middle property, can you show that? Is interesting. It's a it's a building that was modular construction, 
back in the 70s. So we can actually recycle it, take it apart, two sections, and move it somewhere. So we're hoping to find a donee for that as part of it. And we've got some plans to take it apart. We have some experience in modular construction and have uh, actually done this before. So, um, so we think it might be an interesting way for someone to get a, a start with a, with a home. It's, a, it's three bedrooms now? So it's a four bedroom home now. Um, but a, a small home, very nice. But the lot slopes down in the back quite precipitously down into the gully. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Soils are challenging. It's, it's a pretty, and stormwater is a challenge. We have a lot of challenges with the site itself. So what we're trying to do is establish something with some scale so that we can improve the stormwater, improve what we can there. So we, um, and we're at the early stages. We wanted to come early to gain input before we drafted final plans. But we're looking at, so the idea here, this is the same street view without the trees to try to balance out the streetscape. And we have two buildings here, and this one and this one would be, this would be a little shorter than the one across the street from it, and a little shorter than this one. And it would be, we're looking at 12 to 14 units, one, two, and three bedrooms. We're taking one away, that's a four, so a net 13 new ones. Um, of course, new stormwater and, and all that. Um, I heard someone mention energy efficiency. You know, we try really hard to make them as tight as we can because we do own them. So, um, so we would, that that would be obviously an aspect of it. Um, and that's basically it. We're really early on in the process, and we're open to feedback so that we can make it make it better, obviously, than it than it is now. Right now, it's a challenging site to to take care of. Any ten thousand foot questions? I'm not surprised that you might have one. <laughs> Hungerford Terrace is part of the National Register of Historic Places, and I would just encourage you to try to have the architectural facade uh, at least uh, match the neighborhood. So that's interesting. We always have this debate about historic when we talk to the historic folks. The historic people in the city that we talk to would like it to be distinct. I agree with you. I would think it should match. Um, and their logic is, has been, as it's been described to me, is that it shouldn't try to mimic the older. So, um, so that's, that's, and I agree with you, Sharon. It's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that we've been through these meetings before and they've been pushing us in that direction each time. Um, so. Who, who? That was, Who has come up with that? That's Mary O'Neill's suggestion. Mary O'Neill. Now, of course, she's the expert, and maybe we can talk to some city councilors about sure. that. <laughs> sure. Sure. It'd be interesting to. Well, it's not my ward, but I still always weigh in on these things. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on a second, Sharon, because Brian's ahead of you here. Hi. So I'm not a professional architect or anything like that, but I'm really interested in in um, the, the, envi the environment and how the environment affects you know, the human experience and the experience of animals. And, um, and my, my two cents, or in this economy, my two dollars, um, <laughs> is, is, uh, is that it, sh it can be both distinct and blend in that it can blend in with the style of the street, but it can look unique, you know? And I think, I think that's one of the issues with a lot of modern buildings that we're seeing are they're like these bland cubes, like chunks, cubes assembled, and, and, and they're not beautiful. And there's some, you know, there's architecture that we see in some of the other cities in the world um, that might not be appropriate for your site, where you do see unique shapes and nature integrated into the design, um, and iconic buildings like the Pyramid Building in New York or the, the Forest Building in Milan or whatever it's called. Like, there's some really iconic architecture, but the majority of what we're seeing, like what we had planned for downtown in the, in the giant hole, was like this cubicle stuff. So I guess what I would ask is, because Hungerford Terrace is a few blocks away from my house, what I would ask is, 
for something that blends in with the character of the neighborhood but is distinct. And in 100 years, when people look back, they say, look at that building that's 100 years old, and look at that building that's 200 years old, and look how they're similar yet different. And also, I would ask that you think about the green space. I know that you took the trees out symbolically, but, it, it, but that's actually happening all over Burlington. A lot of trees are getting cut down as much as they're being planted. So I would just ask that you also take into account the green space and yeah. the, the landscaping. Sure. Yeah. The new, okay. The one, the idea, the dream. This is why you're talking. Hang on a second. Sharon had a, a question. I just wanted to know the trees really are going to be there, though, right? You oh yeah, we're not taking down <laughs> trees. I mean, that was that was a very big concern because I mean, because we seem to forget the value of the trees and how they clean the air and i'm just really worried about oh. this i mean it was just stated now but um so um and also do you have a picture of the street um if i was facing the old and the new building i'm looking down but can i see it face on like how the how they look I don't feel front like the I can the front of it. Yeah, because I don't really feel like I get a good sense of how it's integrated at all. I, uh, right. um, and so I think that's um, something that I think everyone would like to know. So at this point, we haven't gone to, we haven't applied for anything yet. So, right. And so we're working on these. We don't, we're not fully baked in terms of all the plans. But I agree with you. First of all, the trees. Um, we have to be really conscious of creating parking areas that cause heat to radiate. So we are, we're looking, we're keeping as many trees on the site as we can. We're making a, shade, making a shading plan that makes sure that it would basically be covered and you wouldn't have the, the heat radiating. And the trees on the street we're not taking. We had to take one in front of the house in question. The city asked us to to, to because it was dying, but if anyone notices that, we, we didn't want to. So, if you take a big tree out and you put a new one in, it, it doesn't have the same environmental impact and it takes forever for it to grow. Right. We had to remove this. Yeah. This tree is gone now since this picture yeah. was taken, but we were required by the city because it's dead. Okay. So. We have a, one more question. Thanks. What's um, happening with the gas station right next door to this property? Is that yours also? No. Um, we tried really hard to talk to him about, sh right now it's a parking lot that has a violation on it and he won't uh, we're, so my dentist happens to be Dr. Lavoie next door and I'm trying you know he struggles to find parking for his for his um, employees and we want him to stay there same with Dr. Averill next door and you know there would be a really nice way for us to get together and maybe build a nice brick sort of place where you couldn't see any of the park you, you, so a parking lot cannot be a parking lot in that zone per se, and that's why it's a violation. But it can support another use if you merge the lots. And, I, and we've been trying to talk to him, but he won't respond, doesn't seem to want to sell or lease to us. We would really like to clean up the site, maybe well, someday, but I don't, I'm not hopeful. Yep. So, um, one more, yep. What about building a building that doesn't have parking? Well. We'd have to t talk to the zoning people because we can't do that under our current zoning ordinance right now. Um, we do really believe in TDM strategies and we implement them and we, could, we have a long list of things that we do with our tenants to make sure that they're, uh, we try to work with our tenants so that there's only one car or less per unit. We give free bike, we, we give free, um, we have a, a trolley that attaches to a bike. So wait, hang on a second. We, I'm sorry, but we're going to. Uh, we have another question, and we, we don't want to get into the into the the, uh, the weeds here now because we, again, we're going to have you guys back. So I, I recognize this might be more complicated, but if you knew there was demand, would you be interested in making it a cooperative house housing? Sure, I'd have to look at the zoning bylaw to see if it works. Each zone has their own uses, and I don't know if cooperative house is allowed. Um, at one point, I looked at like a hostel there or something, but you know that didn't please me because I want to provide housing that's more long term for the community. So, um, but sure, we would consider something like that. So, uh, 
Thank you, gentlemen, and apologies that we didn't have a lot of time for you. If you could send us electronic versions of these elevations, that would be great. The only thing I would say it might be a couple weeks because we'd yes. like to get what you're asking for a little more detail, um, and the architects are a little busy for the next few weeks, but we will be back with something more definitive than this. Yeah, and um, you probably know the process that the, the uh, one of the first steps in the review process is to get uh, NPA input. Uh, which this evening is not about. So we'd want more particulars from you, and then we do do a review process here before you're going to. Uh, yeah, I'm the not city. sure how that works. But we, we can, can talk about it. it. We, can we, don't, we don't need to do that yeah. now. So uh, we have another one more important conversation. I don't want we don't want to give it short shrift. So um, Mark Hughes is on the uh, the police commission. Is that the right terminology? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So we, we would have had 10 minutes, but we have seven. And that just goes to show you how important this subject is. Not only did they put us all the way on the back end, but they stole three minutes from us on the front end because we were talking about trees. But what I'm here to talk about is, is to talk about uh, civilian oversight of law enforcement. And it is a lot more important than, uh, to a lot of vulnerable categories than it is to others. Uh, and I'll just, you know, I am a police commissioner here in, uh, in Burlington. And I just, what I wanted to do, mostly do is just answer some questions. Um, I can tell you just a little bit about what we do uh, because I think that will probably clear up some things. <clears throat> the fifth and the sixth articles of the Constitution of this state, what they do is, is they provide us the ability to elect officials and it, by proxy, those officials have responsibility for the management of the law enforcement folks in each province, okay? The 25th uh, rule of the House of Representatives uh, provides the uh, Government Operations Committee in the House oversight responsibility of law enforcement in the state, okay? What we have in terms of law enforcement, in terms of major bodies of uh, civilian oversight of law enforcement in the state is the, the State Police Advisory Commission. How many people have heard of that before? Okay, that is the preeminent commission, the preeminent civilian oversight of law enforcement apparatus in the state, which has oversight responsibility for one third of the state police, which cover 90% of the land mass. That's the state police. The only other agency in the state that has civilian oversight law enforcement uh, capabilities or uh, responsibilities is the commission here in Burlington. That's us, and we have responsibility for about 105 officers. That's us. <clears throat> Those are the only two civilian oversight apparatuses of law enforcement in the state, okay? The city council um, has responsibility for the delegation of our responsibilities. We have no responsibilities in the absence of their delegation. The only responsibility that they have delegated to us is to review outcomes of complaints. That is all. It's all we do. And in our recent events that have occurred, that circumvented us. We didn't even see that. So it's bad. I'm going to stick around to make it better. I'm here to answer questions from you. But at the end of the day, if you don't have adequate law enforcement oversight in Burlington, you can only look to yourselves because you elect the city councilors. And they delegate our responsibility. What are your questions? Yeah, Hang on a second. There's a question over here first, because the microphone, and I'll get around to you. Yes, sir. Okay, I, I, I think you may not have all the answers, but <laughs> well, the, the, commi the commission's responsibility, I think you said, is a narrow one to deal with complaints, right? Is that correct? The commission's responsibility, as delegated by the city council, is to review outcomes of complaints. Okay. So, so my understanding is that the, the recent things that have happened at the police department and put us in a position we're in now kind of began with some complaints that, that Mr. Winkleman uh, made hey, Charles. and that and were, were not actually addressed, it seems like. They were sort of smothered. So I, I guess I'd like your, your, your take on kind of what happened and where we are now. I don't know what happened. Uh, and that's kind of the point. Um, we, we still have to figure that out. Um, at this point, um, as your commissioner, I'm standing in front of you and telling you that as a commissioner of your oversight apparatus, I do not know all of the details surrounding the case of Mr. Winkleman. Hang on. 
here and then over to you, Pat. Um, I was just wondering what is the best way to contact the police department if we have feedback or complaints, um, if we're seeking an actual response? I, I think it's just, you, you know, you just call in like normal. I mean, there's, there's just a regular call in line. I mean, I, I don't understand. I mean, I'm glad you asked that question because I feel a little silly because I'm not quite sure. But I, I think you just call, you just call the police, you know. Just, yeah. We have a, a police that, department. Were you set me up or something? Hang on. Can, can you come over here with me? The hell? Uh, good evening. My name is Jay Lawson. I'm actually one of the lieutenants at the Portland Police Department. Um, I have recently been reassigned. I've uh, been with BPD for 20 years. Uh, my anniversary is in 16 days. Nice. Um, thank you. I actually spend a great deal of my time as the a sergeant in this district and have recently been reassigned, like I said, from the downtown business district to, to your areas, one, one and eight. So, uh, quick question, filing complaints, there's many, many ways of doing that online, reporting directly to your council representative, city hall, uh, you can always call the police department. Um, we try to make it as easy as possible. Uh, we understand the difficulty it is for someone to make a complaint to a police department. Come on in to the police department when you had a bad interaction. We get that, so we try to make as many ways as possible for that to happen and we're looking how we can increase that as well. And on our website too, there's an online process. Um, particular to my responsibilities, I'm, this is my first MPA in a long time for you guys up here. Um, there was a gentleman, I recognize the accent from the city council meeting the other night, who was, yes, sorry I forgot your name sir, but um, mentioned um, not having good representation in here for you guys. Uh, when I was here, I tried to make those uh, appearances before, um, even before Lieutenant Sullivan was the uh, lieutenant that was visiting here. Yeah. So I plan to be here as much as possible. I'm actually going to be working the evening shifts um, once I get back from an injury. Um, Can you say your name again? Yeah, my name is Jason Lawson, but I go by Jay. Um, so please uh, consider me your resource. Um, I plan on getting the officers in your district to come to these as well. I think it's important that you guys meet them so you have a face to recognize uh, when you do see them on the street um, or if you do need our services at some point. So uh, I don't want to take Mark's time because I know it's important. So I just want to introduce myself and if there are questions, I'll be around for a little bit afterwards. Thanks for showing up too. Of course. And uh, I, I didn't understand your question as a complaint call. I thought you asked just how do you contact the police. So there's a complaint apparatus online as well. Okay. Okay, so Did you ask for Mrs. Soraya okay, and sorry. Uh, Jack. Hi, just to clarify, so you review the results of a complaint. Does that mean you do not know what the complaints are until the results come in? I've seen some complaints and in, in many I haven't. It's it's been sporadic. I've been I've been on the um, on the commission for about eight, seven or eight months. This one I didn't see. And as I understand this complaint, this particular complaint, I think it spanned across the period of about four or five months. And I think what we've been, what we were doing was, is we were dealing really with an officer's behavior as opposed to the genesis of that particular complaint and the, enti the entirety of that complaint. So I'm not quite sure what, um, what it all is. So I'm, I'm hoping our next steps. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know that the commission actually. Um, uh, we didn't go into an emergency session until just, I think it was yesterday is the first time we went into an emergency session through all of this. Uh, I disagree with it. I push back with it, uh, on it hard. Uh, I'm one of eight commissioners and I'm not the chair. Um, I think we should have been in executive session on day one. Uh, that's my opinion. We've got a lot of um, uh, things to, to cover. Uh, as far as understanding our internal processes and how we deal with things like this. But I think most importantly, I think what we really got to understand is, is that, again, you elect city councilors. City councilors decide the scope of our responsibility. This is the scope of our responsibility, and uh, this is what you got. I, I would just add, uh, not to belabor the point, but um, outside of either Copwatch, BTV, or Mark, uh, those are really the only two people or organizations at this point I would go to if I had a complaint about police. Um, frankly, the police commission, uh, the chair, and the vice chair uh, really did an incredibly poor job. Um, and I, I would not ask anyone to go and, and deal with the kind of uh, gaslighting um, that I and, and Michael Fife and others have, have seen. Um, I don't want to take up any more time. Thank you. Thanks, Charles.
Um, and Charles and I haven't talked yet either. We sat together all night. We, I've had, I haven't even had a conversation. It's the first time I've ever met him face to face, actually. Um, I had a question, which I'm sorry if this isn't actually within your purview about this. No, can't answer it. <laughs> about the special committee, and I know that they've been meeting for many, many months, and it seems like everybody who's been part of that is really frustrated, um, and they're not really coming to any real resolutions um, or recommendations. If you could talk to that body and tell them what you think that should be, like if they had recommendations about um, the committee and how the city council should consider changing the committee, what would those be? So I think what needs to be happening is, is first of all, maybe we should make this an elected uh, uh, office, or maybe there should be at least some type of criteria that's defined so it's a meritocracy. So just a minute. Um, that was we got a cue here. So it's a Jack, Jonathan. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, and Sharon. That was, that was going to be my, one of my questions, is do you think it should be elected? And I'm glad that we're starting that conversation, not only here, but other places. Um, so I'll jump to my other question, which is, what do you feel like should be the role of the police commission? You know what I think is? I think you should be asking that question to your constituents. Because you work for them. Okay. You are my well, I'm only one, and I happen to be a commissioner. And I, I don't mean that, you know, negatively, because you, just oh, for no, you. That's what so so if anybody do. know, doesn't know, this is, this is a really good friend of mine. Okay. Yeah, no, that's so, what I'm trying to do right now. And I think yeah. you offer a really valuable perspective. And I think this is the venue to have this conversation right. with, so, with constituents. So I, 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 would, I would pass the mic on that and ask folks in the room to respond. Because, but I, do, I think it's a valuable question. Uh, you know, what do you think? The, and I think the commission, the, the special committee that you uh, appointed, you know, I, I think they were charged to answer that question too, I would, I would imagine. But they're not answering so, it. <laughs> so I don't want to touch that, the answer to that question because I, I've given the extent to what, how it is and I want to answer it. And <clears throat> again, I, again, the city councilors, just like our legislators, because this the same thing with the State Police Advisory Commission. Why is it that the chair of the State Police Advisory Commission works in a law firm right here in town uh, and defends police in a regular course of, of, of her job on a regular basis, Nancy Sheehan? Nancy Sheehan. Why is it that the State Police Advisory Commission chair works in a firm with the, with the uncle of T.J. Donovan right here in town? Why is that? Because of you. Because you, because you guys, you, you're, you're the guys who elected the legislators who made the decision to put this person in place. When you say civilian oversight of law enforcement, it's civilian oversight of law enforcement. It's your job. You're the ones who have to, you're the ones who elect those officials by Article 6 of the Constitution of this state, and they, they, they move forward with the power that's invested in them by Article 5 of the, of the Constitution of this state. And Article 25 and, and Rule 25 of the House Rules is what gives the House oversight of them. But, you, but you're the ones who put them in office, and when they're not doing their job, and when that, when that oversight is not sufficient, then you need to call them into accountability. Jonathan? Well, I don't, I don't know if I can follow that. Um, <laughs> I, I want to speak just out of ignorance. I, uh, I understand the very narrow, um, the very narrow charge that you've been given. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I, I recognize that you're explaining to me the very, very narrow charge. What I'm, what I'm curious about is, is there a formal process, or is there any kind of process by which those complaints go to the commission? So it sounds like you hear some, but you don't hear some um, to review. And that sounds like there's a gap somewhere upstream also. Um, I, I think that's very astute to observe. And I, and I, I, would, you know, I would just say that you know, obviously that's, you know, that's been in flux for, for what seems to be years. Only thing I can tell you about it is what's been happening for the last eight months. And from that assessment, from what I've seen, it's, if it is, it's not consistent. So there's no, there's no formal process, there's no guarantee that the complaint will end up in... There has been no guarantee that I have seen all of the complaints that have come, okay? okay. I'm, I want to be careful about what I say because, you know, we, are, we have been kicking around, Sharon, if you recall, the, the um, process, there's one process, one, one process that we have, and what it is is it, 
it defines how it is we go about reviewing complaints. And it's been going back and forth for the last several years, uh, literally, uh, through um, to, to us and then over to the folks at uh, Public Safety. And I think we're on our second, second iteration of that or something like that. But as far as formal processes are concerned, that's what we got. Other questions we so, got to get out uh, of here. Mark, I just wanted to make sure. I mean, my understanding is that the police commission also is responsible for the policies that um, govern the police department. Uh -huh. And so, um, and I just wanted you to speak to that if you could. <clears throat> I have, I have, um, no, there's no formal delegation of our responsibility for policies from the city council, no. Um, but. But, I, but what I have seen is, is that um, there have been discussions about policies uh, in, in the commission uh, when there's been proposals to revise policies, and yes, we've, we've had discussions about them. So, right, because yes. I've been to a few, not recently, mm -hmm. but a few police commission mm -hmm. meetings when a policy was being revised, and mm -hmm. the police commission did weigh in on that, and I am not aware of any change in that. Um, responsibility. I, I wouldn't disagree that you've been to a, a meetings that, that we've been, we've chimed in on reviews of policies. I wouldn't disagree with that. Oh, I've already got a mic. So um, I, I guess one, one thing I would suggest is going back and object uh, to the question about voting for commissioners. I don't think voting for commissioners makes a lot of sense unless and until commissioners are confer, uh, com have more power uh, that's conveyed through the city charter. Um, there's been over 30 years a uh, process of uh, consolidating power in the, mayor's, uh, in, the, in the mayor's office and in the mayor. Uh, there used to be a lot more power in the commissions. Um, some of this came because um, back when Bernie was <clears throat> first elected, the commissions um, were not accountable in any way to the mayor and they could basically, um, you, know, you know, folks who were new to Burlington may have heard that infamous Bernie couldn't get his own uh, assistant um, way back in the early days. And a lot of that had to do with um, too much power in the commission. And so it was a 20-year trend of um, devolve, taking commission power away from the commissions and ultimately having the mayor have, having the higher, hiring and firing power of department heads. Um, and so I, I personally actually always thought that was somewhat of an overreaction. And I think it's something that should be reconsidered. Um, there's very, very little, I mean, ultimately, to have power as a commissioner or as a body, um, you need to have some form of uh, accountability from the head of the department, whether it's the police chief or some other department head. And right now, the accountability is all is sidestepped. It's directly to the mayor, um, because as commissioners, you don't have any kind of hiring and firing power. And uh, I think, personally, that should be reconsidered. There should be some kind of, uh, um, I, I, I would say, you know, it shouldn't, the power shouldn't rest absolutely with the commissions or absolutely um, with, with the mayor's office. And I think that's a place to start so the commissioners get more uh, accountability to them and have more, uh, more say, whether you're talking about police commission or uh, one of the other commissions. Thanks. Uh, Mark, I'm Keith Pillsbury, University Keith. of Terrace, Ward 8, but I've been in Ward 1 uh, before. We're long-term residents, and one of the things my wife and I never understand is why a policeman seem to shoot to kill rather than shoot to wound when they're feeling threatened. And is that a policy that you, that the police, police, police commission, or where does that come from? I can, uh, I'll answer that briefly. We don't shoot to kill. We, we shoot to control the situation in, in the last, last opportunity we have. Uh, so uh, use of force is something that uh, is a, a difficult, difficult area. Just yeah, yeah. It's a, I'm, I'm more than happy to come back and talk to more people out, outside of this venue about, about this. But uh, and bringing the experts that can speak to it. I'm not an expert in use of force. I'm trained in use of force. Um, I've experienced it over the 20 years from the first day I put my uniform on. So um, there's different tiers to it, but we don't shoot to kill people. We shoot to control the situation that's presented to us, not the ones we try to present. So it's a very challenging thing. And I mean, I, I would love to hook you up with someone who could explain that 
more, more precisely than I can, but uh, we do, we'll, just we'll to clarify We'll that. follow up on this. We'll yeah, absolutely. Of course, we'll have you back. And I think the other thing is, is I, I want to be really clear about it, going back to something that you said over there, is, is that um, this is not about uh, whether the commission has, you know, all power or no power. Um, I think the relationship that we have, and I have a pretty good relationship with law enforcement, um, but the relationship that we have with them is defined by our, 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 um, our duties and responsibilities. And if every time you see me it's because somebody said you did something wrong, then what kind of relationship is that? Uh, there's a bunch of food here, speaking of refreshments. Uh, we have plates and stuff, please, please take it. We, we want it to, be, to go to good use. And thanks a lot, and we'll see you again at the February uh, debates and then back here in March.